Hello, everyone. Welcome. Happy Friday. Week one is coming, coming to an end. I hope everybody's doing well. Hope your first week has been good. I know it can be a little crazy. So we're just at 1120. We're going to give people just a couple more minutes to come in. Um, today, we're going to be taking care of just a couple of uh, sort of housekeeping things, a couple of reminders about what's um, happening, what's due this week, what's coming up next week. And then we're going to do our lab material. And today, we're scheduled to finish up our discussion of biosafety in the microbiology lab. And then we're going to uh, watch a video together that I made for you about the care and use of a light microscope. Um, so that's what we'll be up to today. Uh, first things first though, um, I'm still looking for several people who I have not seen on Monday or Wednesday. So instead of taking attendance the usual way this morning, uh, which is generally that I ask you to type your name into the chat box, um, I may also send you a, a little message through the chat box privately um, to see if you're here. <laughs> um, again, I'm just trying to find a few folks who haven't been to our meetings yet, and I'm not sure they're still um, wanting to take the course. So, so first things first, um, if you are here, go ahead and type your first name into chat. Thank you very much. That's the way I take attendance generally. Um, and that's a nice record for a, a, a record that you were here. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, so generally, remember when you come into our meetings, you're going to want to um, turn off your video feed and mute your microphone um, when you contribute in class and, and participate in class, which I highly recommend. Um, you can turn your video and your audio back on. You have those controls right at your fingertips. The reason I ask us to stay sort of black behind our, um, our video feed and not um, be visible is because the, there can be streaming issues with, um, with Zoom. So if we, um, if we come out of our video feed and we turn off our microphone, um, that can help. That can help with um, keeping our streaming um, nice and even. Um, so this week, this week, remember you have a couple of things to do for me. You have one lecture video to watch on YouTube, and that's the introduction to the microbes video. And I can see in the analytics for our playlist that um, several of you have already done that. Um, you then have a quiz, a lecture quiz posted on Blackboard to take. Um, a few of you have already done that. Thank you very much. Remember the lecture quizzes are quite short. They're generally five questions for five points, but the lecture quiz points really do add up. So um, it, Many of my students tell me that the, the little lecture quizzes are actually very helpful for their grade um, because it's a nice way to earn points um, in sort of a low stress situation. Um, now, um, in terms of laboratory, um, remember today we're gonna finish up our first lab essentially, which is a combination of two topics. It's biosafety, which we started last time and the care and use of the light microscope. Um, and again, we'll finish that up today. And then you'll be able to complete your first lab homework. Now this week, because it's the first week of class, both the lecture quiz and the lab homework are due by Sunday at midnight. 
that's an unusual schedule, but I do it because it's the first week. And I know everybody's very stressed trying to get their schedules worked out and trying to figure out how to take each class and, and so on and so on. Next week, things will change. But for this week, you actually have three things due by Sunday at midnight. You have your lecture quiz for intro to the microbes. You have your first lab homework and you have the student survey to complete for me. And many of you have already turned that in and I appreciate that, thank you. Um, but if you haven't done your student survey yet, go ahead and um, finish that and send that in to me if you would. Now I wanna give you a heads up about next week. Um, so you'll wanna jot down a couple of notes for yourself um, about our schedule next week. Next week is actually an unusually busy week for us. And it's just because of the topics that we're scheduled to do. You have two lecture videos to watch. Um, and you have, um, again, laboratory on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Now, none of that is unusual. What's unusual is that you're going to have three lecture quizzes. <laughs> and that's just because of the topics we're covering. Um, let me go ahead right now and um, share a screen with you. Bear with me. So what you should be seeing on your screen now is our YouTube channel called Science Science. Um, it has this bright pink banner, so that's uh, pretty recognizable. Um, and remember, when you come to our channel, you're not going to want to try to navigate through all of the different courses on our channel. It's much better to click on playlists and then go to our playlist, which is the New England College playlist. Hello, everyone. And remember, this is where you're going to find any video recorded material for our course. So that's what you should be seeing on your screen right now. So you can see over here, here's the introduction to the microbes lecture. And here are our first two lab meetings posted for you. This was the meeting from Monday. Here's Wednesday's meeting. And later on today, I'll be posting today's meeting, just in case you want to go back and review any information that we talked about. Now, let's look at next week's. The first uh, video for next week is called History of Microbiology and Microscopy. These are two shorter topics, which is why we combine them together into one lecture. But they're still two separate topics. A little bit about the history of microbiology and the sort of the forefathers of microbiology. Um, and also a little bit about the science of microscopy. How is it that microscopes work? And what are the different forms of microscopy that we use? So those two topics are put together in this one lecture. There will be two lecture quizzes because there's two topics here. And then the other lecture you're gonna be viewing next week is this one right here, which is called The Cell. This one's broken into five shorter videos and there's a lecture quiz associated with it. Now, Next week, we're going to start into our regular lecture quiz schedule. And that means you have to watch the lectures and, of course, take a good set of notes and take the lecture quizzes so that you can submit them by Thursday at midnight. So however you want to order yourself between now and next Thursday, however you want to schedule yourself to watch those two videos, um, two video topics, I'll call them, because of course there's several short videos. Um, you're going to want to get those watched and you're going to want to get your lecture quizzes taken so that they are submitted by Thursday at midnight. So um, that's our typical schedule for lecture videos. You're going to want to make sure you've watched all of them by Thursday so that you can get your quizzes in on time. Now, the other thing that I want to just um, jump on is our Blackboard page, um, just so we can think about um, how you find your information each week. I know lots of you have already 
um, familiarized yourself. Lots of you have already familiarized yourself with Blackboard and that's great. Like I said, some of you have already done your assignments for the week um, or at least partially done them and that's great. Um, so here's our homepage for Blackboard. When you click on your course, you're gonna see something like this. Of course, my view looks different from yours because my tasks are different from yours. But when we go into the course Microbiology, um, you're going to want to go over to this left-hand menu here and click on course content because this is where all the materials for our course are organized for you week by week. So here's that start here module that um, you've been through and here's the first two weeks. So this week, February 1st and next week, February 8th. Remember all the materials for each week that are not videos are organized into these folders. So if you click on this week, and we've looked at this before, you've got your to-do list here, you've got your uh, lecture quiz to take, you've got your lab homework to do. I actually added in another document, which is called the instructor interaction information. This is just a little uh, Word document for you that tells you about how long it takes me to answer emails and about how long it takes me to grade exams and things like that. So you can always look that up if you're interested. And then down at the bottom, I have a folder called slide sets. And if you click on that, you're gonna find just the slides for the videos that are up on YouTube. Some students find these slides very helpful. Some students like to take notes on the slide set while they're watching videos. So here's the lecture slides and here's the laboratory slides for the week. Okay, and you'll have slides available to you each week for lecture and laboratory. Now, if I go back into course content here, if I look at next week, again, here's your to-do list. This is what your to-do list will look like. Most weeks I have greatly um, um, sort of cleaned it up for next week so that um, it's easier to read now that you know how to do all this. Here's the lecture videos, here's the lecture quizzes. Oh, actually I wrote here, um, I apologize. I have different due dates here. I'm thinking, I'm sorry, I told you Thursday night for your quizzes, but I've actually broken them out. That's right, I'm, I apologize. I'm thinking of another class that I teach in micro. Um, so the way we'll do it is, your first lecture for the week, the quiz will be due by Wednesday at midnight. The second lecture will be due by Friday at midnight. I did separate them out, I remember that now. Um, attend our lab meetings, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Next week, we're doing these topics and then complete the lab homework and get it to me by Sunday at midnight. Here's the lecture quizzes. Remember, there are three next week, which is strange. Normally we only have two and here's your lab homework. Okay, so everything is organized under course content. That's the place to go when you wanna find out what you need to do and where all the links are. All right, very good. Does anybody have any questions about how to find things? Okay. Um, so after, um, this weekend, all the work instead of Sunday will be due Thursday. Um, I, I, as I just said uh, just a second ago, I misspoke when I said Thursday. You're oh. a, you'll, you have lecture two lectures basically each week to watch on YouTube. And each lecture, instead of being an hour and a half long video, there will be a, several shorter videos. So each lecture is broken up into maybe three or four or sometimes five short videos. Okay. You'll have two lectures to watch and you'll have three lecture quizzes next week, which is unusual. The first two for history of microbiology, those are due Wednesday by midnight. And the second quiz, which is about the cell, are due Friday by midnight. I apologize, I misspoke okay. earlier when I said 
both were due Thursday. I did decide to separate them out in this course and give you um, a little more time to get everything done in the week. So yeah, when you go to YouTube, and again, I can pull this up for us. When you go to YouTube and you um, go to our, um, let me see if I can get this here. You go to our playlist and our playlist is right here. You can see NEC Bio 3210 Microbiology, that's us. And it automatically puts, at least in my view, as it's, um, since I'm the person who um, creates the channel, um, it automatically pulls this video up for me. But you can see that every video in our playlist has a title on it related to the lecture topic. So for this week, your video was introduction to the microbes, but there are actually four separate videos that make up that lecture. Does everybody see that? This one's 19 minutes, this one's 24 yeah. minutes and so on. So instead of posting one long video, I just break it up. So this week was that lecture. Next week, you have two. You have history of microbiology and microscopy. And there were four short videos for that. And then you have the cell. And there are five short videos for that. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. So you're saying that we have two lecture videos to watch, but that's four. So it's actually eight videos is what you're you, saying. I, I tell you what, I'm going to start using a certain, uh, I'm going to use the phrase lecture topic. Okay. So you have two lecture topics next week. You have the topic of history of microbiology and microscopy, and you have the topic of the cell. So instead of saying lecture, you know, two lecture videos, I'm going to say you have two topics to watch. One of those topics is broken into four videos. And those are about 15 minutes each. One of them's 13, one's 14. But these all together, you have to watch them in order now. It says number one of four, number two of four, number three of four, number four of four. It's all the same lecture. I just started and stopped the video recording so that it would be broken up into shorter videos. It's purely a matter of the way YouTube works and how well you can upload shorter versus longer videos. That's all it is. That's fine. I was just simply asking you to confirm yep. if it was eight videos or not. I understand the concept. Okay, great, great. I know it's confusing and I don't want anybody to feel like, um, to feel unsure about how to find anything. Um, remember, remember, as you watch these videos, you're gonna wanna take a nice detailed set of notes for yourself. And you're going to want to do the same when we when we go through our lab exercises, because in this course, you'll be able to keep your notes that you take for yourself at your side when you take examinations and quizzes and things. So when you take your lecture exam, you may have your lecture notes that you've taken at your side. And when you take your lab practical exams, you may have your lab notes at your side. OK, so it's worth your effort. Um, to take those notes. All right, very good. Any other questions about things? What I'm gonna do now is go back to where we stopped um, in our discussion of lab biosafety. That'll be the next screen that I'm sharing with you. If you recall, we stopped right about here last time on this very busy slide. <laughs> Remember, if you don't have it jotted down, you do not need to be able to tell me what the regulations are for each biosafety level in laboratories. You don't need to tell me, for example, that in BSL-2 you need uh, waste decontamination procedures and you need use of biological hoods. You don't need to tell me those things. What I want you to know is that any laboratory that works with living organisms has a BSL level and that these standards are applied in order to keep the people who work in the lab safe 
and also to keep the public safe because we wanna make sure that microbes are not leaving these laboratories, especially if they're pathogenic, if they're disease causing. I also want you to be able to tell me that the numbering system works such that the higher the BSL level, the more hazardous the microbes are that they're working with. So the BSL-4 labs are handling the most hazardous microbes, um, including things like the current uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is causing the pandemic, and that's the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, the BSL labs are responsible for handling novel pathogens, which is what the SARS virus is. And all that word novel means, if you're not familiar with it, is new. This is a brand new virus that appeared on planet Earth recently. Um, it also handles respiratory pathogens specifically that have no treatment or vaccine available. Now, obviously we have a vaccine now, we have a couple of vaccines now, and we are, we are developing really excellent treatments for COVID-19. So eventually people will be able to handle that pandemic virus in BSL-3 labs, which is good news because that means more people will be able to study it. There are many more BSL-3 labs around the country and around the world than there are BSL-4. BSL-4 labs are very expensive to run because they handle such hazardous uh, pathogens. So I put a couple of pictures together just to show you and give you a, a feeling for what it's like to work in these different BSL level laboratories. This image over here on the left shows a woman working in a BSL-1 lab. This probably looks a lot like labs you've walked into or maybe worked at. Um, this could even be a teaching laboratory. You can see she has a workspace in front of her on a bench. She's wearing gloves. She um, also has some sort of um, professional clothing on that perhaps um, is required in this laboratory. That really varies from lab to lab. And she's got her hair back, very good, to keep it out of her uh, workspace. She's following very standard biosafety um, regulations, which is what we do in BSL-1 labs because these are sort of ordinary labs that are not particularly hazardous. Now, this woman over here is sitting in front of one of these hoods. This is actually called a biological hood. This is different from a chemical fume hood. If you've ever been in a chemistry uh, lab or, or when you took chemistry, there, were, there are hoods that are made to um, evacuate chemical fumes so they don't get into the room and um, perhaps injure people. This kind of hood is different. This is a biological hood. And I think you can see there's a glass door here that has been pulled down. So there's a very sh uh, small amount of space for this technician to put her hands through into um, the hood space. What biological hoods do is they create a sterile work surface that gets maintained through a very elaborate system of air currents. So there's air circulating in here, purified air. And what it does is it keeps the work surface here sterile. So nothing else can fall down out of the room air and get into whatever it is she's working on. Now there is one thing that this uh, young lady is doing that um, is not correct. She has gloves on. She's got a lab coat on. What is she not doing that she ought to be doing? Her hair. Her hair. <laughs> yeah, I imagine they did this. Uh, this is probably an actor, um, but, um, but yeah, she should have her hair back um, if she's working in the lab. Now on this slide, you're looking at people who are working in BSL-3, that's over on the left, and BSL-4, that's over on the right. Now, if you look at the um, technician over on the left, this person is obviously um, um, wearing a lot more PPE. Not only is her hair back, but her hair is covered. She has a, um, a mask on her face. She's got um, sort of a, a robe. Um, it's almost, a, it looks like a surgical robe. Um, 
this is um, the kind of clothing that can be washed and then autoclaved. In other words, it can be sterilized. So she's got special clothing on. She's also working in a biosafety hood, a biological hood. Um, so she has a sterile work surface at all times. She's got her gloves on. Um, so it's likely she's working with a pathogenic organism in there, but it's um, uh, an organism that we e either have a vaccine against or we have good treatments for. So if worse came to worse, and she were to become contaminated and infected and sick, um, the risk to her life is low. Over here, this is the most extreme. This is what it looks like when you work in a BSL-4 lab. You can see that this person is wearing a self-contained uh, suit. This suit is connected to this red hose and is supplied with its own air supply. So this person is not breathing room air. Um, they are breathing uh, air through it, uh, a separate supply of air that comes from outside the room and is fed into the suit. She's completely contained inside this suit. Um, just in case there is an accidental exposure. Also working in a biological hood, but this person would be handling pathogenic organisms, probably either bacteria or viral, that are um, brand new, that um, we don't understand much about yet, respiratory pathogens, no treatments, no vaccines yet, um, very, very hazardous work. Um, it's very expensive to run these laboratories. Um, there are um, only really a handful of them in our country. Um, and only specialized personnel are allowed to work in them. And of course, as I said a few minutes ago, um, the people who are currently working on the pandemic virus are working in these labs, but eventually people in BSL-3 labs will be allowed to work on it. And, um, and that's always good because that means more work gets done. All right, let's look at the next slide here. Remember, we always wanna keep those two goals in mind that we talked about last time. We wanna keep in mind that everything we do in the lab is geared around these two things. We don't wanna keep our, I mean, we, we don't want to contaminate, sorry. We don't wanna contaminate ourselves with the microbes that we're working with whether that's a pure culture of microbes that we're growing, or if it's a patient sample that might potentially be contaminated with microbes, we don't wanna contaminate ourselves with our material. And we don't wanna contaminate our material with ourselves because of course we are covered in microbes inside and out. Regardless of the BSL level, those standard sort of lab practices apply. You gotta keep your personal things out of your workspace. You gotta disinfect things before and after you begin. You gotta wash your hands when you come in and before you leave. It's just general laboratory safety practices. Remember, always assume that a surface is contaminated while you're using it, even after you disinfect it. Treat it as though it's contaminated if you are holding something sterile and you don't want it to, to get contaminated, don't put it down. Keep it in your hands. Um, your inoculating loops, for example. Um, if you've just sterilized your inoculating loop in the incinerator, don't put it down on the desktop unless you're planning to incin uh, incinerate it again. Sterilize it again before you use it. Keep caps, lids, things like that. Uh, syringes, needles that are sterile uh, in your hand as you're preparing to use them. Don't put them down on the surface. The thing, the tool we use perhaps most often in a microbiology lab is that inoculating loop. That um, wire with the loop on the end and the metal handle. Remember we, um, we use this to move microbes around. So it's just a constantly potentially contaminated item. So we're constantly sterilizing and re-sterilizing that instrument. And we're either doing it with fire, with a Bunsen burner or with that incinerator. 
Um, there are even in some labs, some older <laughs> uh, teaching labs, especially um, some old alcohol lamps. These are fire. This is open fire with an alcohol lamp, but it, it's not a gas that's burning. It's not a gas being pumped in that's burning. It's plain old alcohol that's burning. You may encounter one of those in your professional life someday. Remember, if you're in the microbiology lab and you're working and you have started your working day, you must always have gloves on. You never touch materials that have microbes growing in them like these in the image. You never handle those materials without gloves on. Keep all your test tubes orderly and upright by using things like test tube racks. Don't, don't lay a test tube down on the desktop that might spill. That would be um, a risk you don't wanna take. Remember, we uh, want to label everything. We wanna um, make sure that anybody who touches any of our materials or who encounters our materials knows exactly what's in that tube or on this plate over here. The other thing I'll mention here is that these Petri dish plates, which we haven't talked about yet, but these plates that um, we use to grow microbes, particularly bacteria, um, these dishes are always kept upside down, whether we're uh, handling them, moving microbes on and off of them, whether they're in the incubator growing microbes, or if we are um, making them, preparing them for use in the lab, we always handle them upside down. Now that may seem strange to you, but um, these plates are designed to hold a solid medium in them that we call auger. It's a material that's a lot like gelatin. It's, it's, um, it's solid, but if you were to touch it with your finger, you could push your finger through it very easily. We layer this auger onto the bottom of the plate and we grow the microbes on top of the auger. There is a lid that goes on this dish to help keep it sterile. But when you put these dishes into the incubator to allow the microbes to grow, they tend to form condensation because there's a lot of water in the auger. So rather than having the condensation form on the lid and then drip down onto the auger surface, we always keep the plates upside down so that the condensation is gonna drip away from the auger down onto the lid. You don't want a lot of condensation, in other words, landing on your culture. Not because it's not sterile, it is, but because it could interfere with the growth of the microbes that you're trying to grow on this plate. So it's just one of those strange things when you handle auger plates, you always keep them upside down. The last thing on this slide to look at is this bag. You can see there's a great big biohazard symbol on this bag. This red bag with that great big symbol is an autoclave bag. These are the bags that are used to um, collect contaminated material that is considered single use that is being disposed of um, we place everything in the bag, we tie up the bag, we put it into this autoclave machine. And again, we are gonna talk about autoclaving in detail later on, but remember that what an autoclave does for us is it raises to a high heat and a high pressure. And any living cells that might be on materials in this bag will be killed in the autoclave. So it allows us to um, dis, uh, I shouldn't even say disinfect, to sterilize the materials in here, get rid of all the microbes that might be in here, sterilize it, kill everything, and then we can throw this in the trash. So these are special bags that are used in um, any laboratory that handles microbial organisms. Teaching labs, of course, are BSL-1, but we still use all those standard safety procedures that we've gone through to, um, today and last time we were together. Remember, 
even though a lot of what I've said in this lecture is it's a little bit scary. It's a little bit, it makes you a little nervous about handling microbes. But remember, most microbes, the vast majority of microbes are not pathogens. But there are a handful of pathogens. There are pathogens that can harm us. And especially if we're working in the healthcare field and we're working with samples that have come from sick patients, we are handling potentially pathogenic microbes. So the best practice is to treat all microbes as though they are pathogens. Take all the steps necessary to keep yourself safe, just in case you're handling a pathogen. Remember, microbes don't fly. They don't jump up off of the desktop and somehow get into your um, materials. They fall. They fall out of the sky, essentially. They fall out of the air on dust particles in the air. So if you were to open a culture tube that had microbes growing in it, or if you were to open an auger plate that had microbes growing on it, they cannot jump up and infect you um, off of that material. The only way you would get in contact with them is if you were not careful and you you again like touched your mouth or touched your eyes or your nose. Um, microbes fall. They come out of the air by falling. They don't leap up out of things. So we need to remember this and we need to remember that while we're trying to keep things sterile, we don't keep sterile things open to the air any longer than we need to. If I have to open up a sterile tube because I wanna take cells out or I wanna put cells in, I wanna keep that tube open as short a time as possible. If I wanna open up a sterile auger plate, I wanna keep that plate open as short a time as possible. These are all very good practices for preventing contamination. All right, any questions so far? Any questions about any of the biosafety techniques we follow, we've talked about? Remember in your professional life, wherever you end up going, wherever you end up working, um, if you are going in and out of laboratory spaces, every laboratory has its own sort of uh, unique set of practices on top of these sort of standard biosafety practices. And a lot of this, while it sounds um, maybe difficult to um, learn, uh, once you start working in that kind of a laboratory setting, you tend to pick this up very quickly. For example, um, you get to the point where if you were to walk into a lab and, and you didn't have gloves on, um, you would feel strange. You would, you would not wanna touch anything because you'd be thinking in your head, oh, I need gloves if I'm gonna to touch something in this room. Um, it really does happen pretty quickly once you begin just doing day-to-day -day work in that kind of a setting. All right. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and we're gonna start talking about the light microscope. Um, unfortunately, you don't get to get your hands on a light microscope in this course, but um, we're gonna learn about them and we're gonna use them in the sense that um, as we do our lab exercises and I demonstrate things for you, I'm gonna show you what I'm seeing under the microscope. Um, so you're um, at least getting comfortable with viewing microbes under a microscope, even if you're not actually handling the instrument. Um, as I said earlier, I know that some of you have um, some good experience with light microscopes and others of you don't. So um, this video that I'm gonna show you might be just a review for some of you. And for others, this might be brand new information for you. Um, so we'll watch this together. And then if anybody has any questions, uh, we can talk about them. There are lots of controls that we need Whoops. to be familiar with. Um, Sorry about that. 
Actually, that may be the beginning. Hold on. There are lots of controls that we need to be familiar with on the microscope, starting, of course, with the light source control. The light is going to come up through the base of the scope and through two structures, the iris diaphragm right here and no, the you condenser. Know what? I'm pretty sure this is not, excuse me, just a sec, folks. I thought this had a different start point, but I guess it doesn't. Well, let me say, since it doesn't say this in the video, let me say that um, what you're looking at here in this picture is what we call a compound light microscope. And this microscope, if I can um, make it a little bit bigger for us here, this microscope has two eyepieces on it. There are monocular microscopes out there in the world, microscopes that have one viewing port or one eyepiece, but modern microscopes all have two. And that's important to know because when you use this kind of light microscope, a binocular microscope, you have to keep both of your eyes open. And for some students, that's a little bit hard. They want to close one eye um, because it feels more normal to them. But um, you have to, they are designed so that you keep both of your eyes open. So um, that's what we mean when we call it a binocular microscope. Um, the other thing to note about a modern microscope is that it doesn't have one objective lens to peer through to magnify things. It has several and they are all positioned on this wheel so we can rotate different lenses in and out of place. We give this a name, we call this feature um, by a name. We say that this is a compound light microscope. It's a microscope that has multiple objective lenses available to us that we can rotate in and out of place. Um, all right, so I'm gonna start the video again. There are lots of controls that we need to be familiar with on the microscope, starting of course with the light source control. Light is gonna come up through the base of the scope and through two structures, the iris diaphragm right here and the condenser. The iris diaphragm is gonna determine how much light comes in you can see you can adjust that for the lens you're using. And the condenser is going to focus that light up through your specimen sitting on the slide on the stage. It's important that you remember the condenser underneath, this, underneath the stage so that your light source is correct for the lens you're using. There are controls underneath the right side of the stage that will help move your slide around on the stage and move the stage itself. It's critical when you place a microscope slide onto the stage that you seat it into these silver clips here because those will hold the slide steady while you move the stage or move the slide itself. Remember, a compound microscope has multiple objective lenses available for us to use. On this black ring structure, there are grooves that we can hold on to and rotate which lens we want in place at any one time. On any compound microscope, there's going to be a series of lenses ranging from a low power lens, typically either a 4X or 5X, and we have a 4X here, moving up to either a 10X or a 20X lens, then up even further to a 40X lens, and then finally to the oil immersion lens, 
which is a 100x lens. It magnifies the object on the slide 100 times. Now, you should note that the 40x lens is a lens called the high dry lens. It's a high powered lens, relatively speaking, at 40x magnification, but we use it dry. In other words, we don't put any oil on the slide with a 40x lens. The only lens that uses oil with it is the 100x lens. In fact, you can only use that lens with oil. So we always have to be very careful when we're rotating our objective lenses, not to accidentally rotate the 100x lens in place. That lens is designed, when it's rotated in place, to come in just on top of the microscope slide. And if there's no oil on the slide, you will scratch the lens. The video's frozen. Oh, there we go. Pieces of Ooh, the microscope. Great. These eyepieces are quite flexible. They're able to be moved farther apart from each other or closer together, depending upon the user. It's tempting when you're using a binocular microscope to keep one eye closed, but they are designed to be used with both eyes open. And in order to see a singular field of vision under the microscope, you need to have the two eyepieces spaced correctly for your it's eyes. It's actually Everybody's just eyes meant to are be paused. A different mm -hmm. distance apart from each other. And that's why modern microscopes have the functionality to move the eyepieces farther apart or closer together. The other thing to note about the eyepieces is that one of them is going to be individually adjustable, like this one on the right. What this means is that you can focus the right eyepiece separately from the left. So if you have complex vision problems, if you wear certain types of glasses, for example, that help with different vision problems in each eye. A modern compound microscope will compensate for that. You can focus the scope for your left eye using the primary controls, and then you can make adjustments for your right eye directly on the right eyepiece. Modern microscopes can compensate for almost any vision problem that the user might have. One other thing to note, if you wear eyeglasses like I do, when you use a microscope, you take your eyeglasses off. The microscope is capable of making all the adjustments that you need to bring a specimen into focus. When you're ready, Take your microscope slide with your specimen on it, place it into the silver clips on the stage, and then using the controls underneath the right side of the stage, move the slide directly underneath your objective lens. You can see here that I've now turned on the light source at the base of the scope, and there's a beam of light coming up from the bottom through the sample on the slide and into the eyepieces. We control the amount of light coming up through the slide using this wheel on the left side of the base of the scope. It's important to remember that the amount of light that you will need to comfortably view a specimen on a microscope slide depends on which objective lens you're using. The lower the power of the lens, the less light you will need. 
the higher the power of the lens, the more light you will need. So we are constantly adjusting the amount of light that we are running through the sample on our slide. The single most common problem that students have when they're learning how to use a microscope is learning how to focus. The question I get most often from students is how do I bring the sample on my slide into focus? And the answer that I give to them is that you're going to follow the same series of steps every single time you examine a slide. You're going to do the same thing every single time until you get really good at it. What you don't want to do when you're trying to focus on a specimen is just jump in and start wildly moving your control knobs that are found here on the right side of the scope. These are your coarse and fine adjustment knobs. The coarse adjustment, the larger wheel here, is literally moving the stage up and down, closer to the lens and farther away from the lens. These are big movements when you are looking through the eyepieces. The fine adjustment knob, the smaller wheel here, is the one that's going to make the final adjustments in your ability to bring your specimen into focus. You want to begin the process of focusing on an object with your fingers on the coarse knob, not the fine knob. Let's talk about the steps that we take every single time when we want to bring a specimen into focus. Once your slide is securely in place in the clips on the stage, with the beam of light visibly passing through the sample on the slide, rotate the lowest power lens into place. And again, on our scope, it's this very small objective lens that you can see here with a red line around it. Ours is a 4X lens. That lens is capable of magnifying the object on the slide four times. Now note that that's not the total magnification that we're using. The eyepieces on a microscope also magnify the image. The eyepieces magnify 10 times. So in order to determine the total magnification that we're using, we have to multiply the magnification of the objective lens times the magnification of the eyepieces. So using this low power lens, we are magnifying that specimen four times 10 or 40 times. Rotate the stage upwards with the course adjustment knob until the slide is as close as possible to the low power lens. Now, start looking through the eyepieces. Slowly rotate the course adjustment knob downwards. You have to do this while you're looking through the eyepieces. As you do this, you're going to see an image appear and then quickly disappear in front of your eyes. In other words, as you rotate the stage downwards, you're going to come into focus and then quickly out of focus with the course adjustment knob. At that point, bring the stage back up until you see that image and then reach for the fine knob. It's the fine adjustment knob that will do the work, that last step of bringing the image into focus for you. 
modern microscopes are par focal. And what that means is, once you have your image in focus on the low power lens, you can move to the next lens with only fine adjustments needed. You can go from lens to lens to lens, and the image will still be essentially in focus for you. Again, you'll probably need to make some very fine adjustments, but you don't have to begin the whole process of focusing all over again. The term we use for that is par focal. We do the focusing process once on the low power lens, and then we can rotate through the next power and then the next power with only fine adjustments needed. You can see that the 40X lens is in place right now in the image. Remember, we call this one the high dry lens. And for many of the things that we examine in a microbiology lab, we can see them under this 40X lens. So bacteria and eukaryotic microbes like fungi and algae and protozoans, we can see under a 40X lens. Remember, if you're asked to determine the total magnification for a 40X, it would be 40 times 10. 40X from the objective lens, 10X from the eyepiece. 40 times 10 or 400X total magnification. Remember, there's one more lens on the microscope and that's the oil immersion lens. That's the 100X lens. The combination of the 100X lens and the eyepiece, 100 times 10, brings us to a total magnification of 1000X when we use the oil immersion lens. We achieve the best detail for microbial specimens when we use the 100X oil immersion lens. We can see basic structure using the 40X high dry lens. In other words, you can see the shape of a bacterial cell using the 40X lens, but you won't be able to get any more detail than that unless you use the 100X oil immersion lens. So it's important that as students of microbiology, we know how to use the 100X lens correctly. And that's what we'll talk about next. Your image is in focus under 40X. Rotate about halfway between the 40X lens and the 100X lens. Using that black wheel again, rotate away from the 40X, but not all the way to the 100X. Stop about halfway between them. Now you need to apply the oil. There's lots of immersion oil products on the market. This one happens to be what we use in our teaching laboratory. This is the Resolve Immersion Oil product. And one of the reasons that I like it is because it uses a, a stick applicator to place one or two drops of oil on the slide. The biggest problem that students have when they place oil on a microscope slide when they're learning is that they tend to place too much oil. The stick applicator in this kind of product helps prevent that. Pull the stick out of the bottle. You can see oil will run down the stick to the end and you'll get a nice drop. That is what needs to go on your slide directly where the beam of light is. One 
maybe two drops only. Just gently touch the stick down towards the slide and you'll get a nice droplet of oil right where you need it. Then you're gonna rotate your lens down into place. If you recall what we said earlier, the 100X oil immersion lens is designed to come in on top of the slide, almost touching it. It's designed to slide in place so that it is literally right on top of the slide. You're gonna feel like the slide is gonna break if you rotate that lens into place. But don't worry, if you have carefully focused your specimen, when you rotate that lens down onto the slide, it will be in the exact correct place. Remember, it's perfectly fine to do a little bit of fine focus adjustment when your oil lens is in place. You're not gonna break the slide if you use your fine adjustment knob. But be warned, if you accidentally start using your coarse adjustment knob, you will break the slide. And anybody who does work in a laboratory using a microscope has broken a few slides accidentally. Once you've finished examining your specimen using the oil immersion lens, it's not possible to go back to the lower power lenses. You now have oil on your slide. And if you were to rotate the 40X or the 20X lens back into place, you would get oil on those lenses. Now it's not the end of the world. You can clean those lenses if you accidentally get oil on them. But even without oil on them, the lower powered lenses will not be able to see what's on the slide as long as there's oil on the slide. The lower power lenses are designed to be used in air. They will not be able to focus on a specimen if there is oil on the slide. So the best practice is to finish your work using the 40X lens before you go up and use the oil immersion lens. Plan your work so that once you're finished examining the specimen, with the oil immersion lens, you're finished with that slide. Now you need to clean up your scope and put it away. If there's one thing that you will find in every single laboratory, it's these boxes of Kim wipes. These little green boxes are ubiquitous and we use Kim wipes for all kinds of little cleanup jobs around the lab. But the one thing you don't want to do with a, Kim, with a Kim wipe is try to clean off an objective lens. Kim wipes are not designed to be used on any kind of a delicate lens. If you took a Kim wipe and tried to clean off, for example, an oil immersion lens, you would scratch that lens. So don't reach for the Kim wipes when it's time to clean up your microscope. Instead, reach for lens paper. This happens to be Fisher brand lens paper. There's all different kinds of lens paper available. Lens paper is simply a very fine, very soft type of paper that has been made specifically for uses on very fragile, very delicate objective lenses. So you can take a piece of lens paper and you can wipe off a dry objective lens. For example, if you think it might have dust on it, you can use lens paper to wipe off eye pieces if they accidentally get dusty or they get some kind of a smear on them from somebody's fingerprint. You can clean off uh, down on the base of the scope where the light source is if dust collects down there. 
lens paper can be used on any type of glass or any type of lens to help keep it clean. If you've used the oil immersion lens with oil, however, you're going to want to take the extra step of using a lens cleaning fluid with your lens paper. Simply place a few drops of lens cleaner onto a piece of lens paper and you're ready to go. Now, it's hard to reach an oil immersion lens when it is rotated into place. So you're going to have to do that halfway rotation between the 40x and 100x lens. And you're going to have to rotate the stage down in order to have the room for your hand to get in there with your lens paper and lens cleaner to appropriately clean your lens. Once you're at that halfway point, just gently wipe off the surface of the lens with your lens cleaner. It will take off all that oil and get the, rent, the lens ready for the next time you need to use it. I always tell students to live by the golden rule in the laboratory. And by that, I mean, leave the equipment the way you want to find it. So, yes, you should always clean off your oil immersion lens before you put your microscope away. But do yourself a favor and clean off the other lenses as well. Clean off the eyepieces. Clean off the light source glass. If you do this and then you put your scope away, you know that your scope is going to be clean and ready to go the next time you use it. So, like I said, whenever you use your microscope in a laboratory, do the right thing, clean it up, and it will be ready for the next person who needs to use it. Once the lenses are clean, rotate the low power lens into place and then using the course adjustment knob, rotate the stage all the way down as far as it will go till it's sitting on top of the condenser. Bring the eye pieces as close together as possible and turn off the light source. Wrap the power cord around the base so that it is safely tucked away and then place the dust cover over the scope. It's really important to keep a microscope covered when it sits in the laboratory because dust really easily accumulates. All right. So that brings us to the end of that video clip. That's really good advice at the end there about remembering to cover your microscope in the laboratory. You can see in the behind me um, the microscope on the countertop and I was using it this morning and I need to make sure that I get the dust cover back on top of it um, so that it doesn't get coated in dust. Um, it's, it's just annoying when you sit down to use a microscope and you look through at your slide for the first time and you'll just see little bits and particles of dust. Um, so it's very good practice to just leave them covered. Um, if you're interested, these uh, compound light microscopes, like the one you see behind me, uh, generally run in the thousands of dollar range. So that scope behind me, which is a, considered a teaching level scope, that would probably run about $4,000 if you were to buy one brand new. Um, you can, of course, buy other types of microscopes, um, which you'll learn about in the lecture next week that only go up in price from there, <laughs> um, all the way up to electron microscopes, um, which can be hundreds of thousands and even millions of dollars, which is why there aren't that many of them available. So, uh, so 
that's just some uh, general information about how we use compound light microscopes and how we care for them. Um, so they'll be available to us next time. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, you now have all of the information you'll need to do your first laboratory homework. Um, there's a couple questions on it about biosafety, and there's a couple questions on it about care and use of the microscope. So you should be all set. Anything else before I let you go to enjoy the rest of your day? Any questions, comments, anything at all? All right, very good. All right, very good. Um, I'm gonna um, let you go if you need me for anything, uh, send me a message through Blackboard. Um, if you have any problems with any of the technology, go ahead and um, shoot me a message and I will try to work through it with you. Um, if not, I will see you on Monday at 1120. All right, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Uh, have a great rest of your day and good weekend. Thank you. Good one.